You can't even believe how exciting it is for me to be here on your longest uh, uh, sermon series, you know, and I promise you to deliver the longest message you will ever hear. So as far as like, I'm, setting, like, I'm setting some standards like, you know, for the sermon, that one time I heard there actually the uh, official recorded um, or record on the sermon is eight days straight of preaching. So there was an amazing thing. There was uh, basically quite a bit of stuff. There was some marathon that one church did, and it was the same pastor that preached for almost all of that time for the occasional breaks that actually was taken on. Actually, it was quite a bit of time. They were preparing for quite, a, uh, quite some time, and I think just the preaching time itself was 56 hours. So welcome to the minute two. <laughs> So uh, when, it comes to, when it comes to the ministry, I'm just excited for the fact that we are not just friends with the churches, but actually we are co-workers in the field. It's been just a great blessing and honor like, you know, to, to minister together with you, with the church. Some of, um, with some of you, we've gone to Mexico, tri- like on a mis- Mexico mission trips a couple times, and there was one upcoming, and we heard about the announcements of that. It's just a great opportunity to serve together. You know, we're not just trying to take something that on ourselves. We're not trying to build the names for ourselves differently as churches. But this is a beauty of God when churches together, they have one goal, they have one God, they have many people to accomplish one goal, believe in one God. Amen? You know, it's just a great opportunity to do so. So as I kind of reflect a little bit on the whole missionary experience, I'd love to uh, tell you that I love stories. And I mean, I once started going to church, what, about 13, 14 years old, with some of you, actually, I, mean, I know a couple of people who are that ancient, that old, they were there with me in Far East Russia. So thank you very much. And I think I'm gonna get in trouble for saying old. But anyways. So when it comes to that, we grew together, ministered together. It was just awesome experience. And I really loved hearing the stories from the mission trips. And there was one time that actually, uh, as we were doing the ministry, one of the missionaries shared me the story that I was kind of blown away by. You probably heard of, uh, heard that. Let me say it one more time. So there was one time in Spain, uh, like in the country in Europe, uh, a, a while back. Uh, probably happen, uh, happened in early 20th century, like maybe like early in 1900s. So there was one time, there was, uh, in a smaller town, there was a father and a son that lived together. Like the, the name of the father was uh, Felix, and the, uh, the name of his son was Rodrigo. Felix and Rodrigo. So two great men, the father, dad, Felix, I mean, they had great relationship. At one point of their life, uh, uh, they, uh, he, uh, his father, or, or, you know, he lost his wife, or, and Rodrigo lost his mom, basically. So they lived together some years after that, and what happened, that at one point, they had a major blow up. So in their relationships, uh, something kind of sparked up. They, like, you know, dad said some bad words and son said some bad words. You know, they lived together for about a week or so, and then they just couldn't handle each other anymore. So, uh, like, you know, son decided to do, the Felix decided, you know what, I'm going to go. So when it comes to that, like, uh, that the father didn't, didn't know where to find his son. And remember, back in the early 1900s, it was really tough uh, like an, on the communication stuff because surprisingly enough, there were no cell phones, no Instagram, no Facebook. I don't know how people lived back then, but you know, somehow they did. So the communication was really difficult. They tried to find each other. Uh, like a dad, actually, sometime later, he realized that he made a big mistake. He wanted to apologize before his son, but he had no way of finding him. So what had happened a little later, is that uh, some brilliant idea came to his mind. So there was like in a town square, like in the middle of the town, like in some square that people often would get together. He decided to, uh, to use a local newspaper to post like an, an apology for his son and ask him to come at a certain time. So the message sounded uh, something like this. My dear son, Rodrigo, I was a fool. Please forgive me for what I said. I regret it so much. Son, I love you. And if, for, if you forgive me, would you please come on a certain day to the town square and then so we can meet up because I did everything I could to find you, but I failed. So there was, there was it. I probably add a couple of words here and there, but you kind of get the point, right? So that day when I mean, then I finally came, and like, you know, Felix is trying to actually go to the uh, uh, square, and it's about just around the corner. So when he walked in the square at that time, he saw about 800 young 
man who came in order to experience their father's forgiveness. And he saw about 700 men, grown up men, looking for their sons. So the truth, when the first time I heard the story, I mean, it sounded neat and great, and then, uh, but, but at the same time, I kind of felt like, you know what, there is something interesting that is happening, that quite often that sometimes we need to make the first step in order to actually experience the forgiveness. You know, what I love about our God, and please uh, open up with me uh, for the quick second, the book of Romans, chapter, eight, verse, chapter 5, verse 8, rather. We're going to read this, an amazing statement that is going to be like a silver lining for us for the whole, uh, that time that we're spending together studying God's Word. So, Romans, chapter 5, verse 8, says this, but God showed His love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What I love here that actually God really was the one who instituted forgiveness. You know, he was the one to bring the forgiveness to the front. There was absolutely nothing that we as people could have done that God's forgiveness could not cover. So when we talk about exercising God's love, experiencing God's love, we understand that there is absolutely nothing that can stop God loving us. And it doesn't give us a permission to do anything we want. It gives us a chance to give everything we have back to the one who has given us all. To say this, to have this little intro, let us go back to the first book of the Bible, that is, that is Genesis. We're going to be looking quite, uh, going to be reading quite a bit of the scripture. So would you please find chapter 12? And as you do that, let me uh, kind of introduce the chapter, introduce that idea for us and what's happening there. So as you studied before and you read chapter 11, there was a big commotion happening with some of the folks that people, they decided to build a great name for themselves. They decided to build a great tower, something that was not pleasing to God. And by the way, you know, it's not that the construction business is not pleasing to God. Any construction folks here? Yes or no? If not, yes? Any construction folks? Anybody in construction? That's okay. It's not shame. It's great. So one, one person has in Thank you for admitting the fact. Thank you just for saying that you are in construction business. I'm going to be referring to, to you a couple often. So do you like the business, but this business, by the way? Are you fine? Great. See, I mean, construction is good, and I believe that God is the greatest. Like, uh, God is the greatest constructor ever, right? He's not a subcontractor, but he is like somebody who holds uh, that general license for everything. Amen. Well, I, I was expecting to hear the great amen from you, brother. <laughs> Come on. So when it comes to this, we understand that God is the greatest person. Like and with that, with, when it comes to con construction, he built everything. He gave a chance for us to experience that as well. You know, God has a beautiful design for the universe. God has a beautiful plan for us. He instituted, he designed it, he, come, like, you know, he put everything together. So he is a designer agency, he is a general contractor, he is, a, he is absolutely everything. He is a supplier as well. So we love this fact. But what happened uh, that uh, when it came to people, and we read in chapter 11, they decided to build the Tower of Babel. What happened that actually they decided to say, hey, God, you know what? We can do something as well. So we've done everything for you. Let us do something for our joy and enjoyment. We're going to build something for us to build that great name so that you can see how great we are. By the way, that song probably was written then. So when it comes to this, what happened at that moment is that actually people decided to say, God, we are somebody and you need to treat us this way. We're going to build something amazing and you have to honor that. So we see that apostasy, the folks decided to do something stupid. They decided to take something that God created and them themselves being created people, they decided to try to create something that would surprise God. Well, there is nothing that can or could. So we see, we see the story of people, and by the way, I'm not pushing the blame or anything like that. What I'm saying is that often we would love to live our lives the way we would love them to be, instead of living uh, according to the greatest plan, how he has designed it for us to be. You know, yesterday we were coming back from, uh, from the, some seminar that we did for the folks who are going to go to Mexico. And we had just an amazing conversation on the way back with one of the brothers. And he said, you know what, I mean, I just, like, you know, I just love the fact 
that I'm getting back into my calling. Because to live outside of the calling, to live, to live outside of God's plan is painful. Let me say, look, in one phrase here, it's just going to be a quick step to the side. But this is what, uh, guys, this is, uh, this is what it is. That for, for hell, there is no, nothing more dangerous than a person who lives according to God's plan or lives according to God's calling. For heaven, there is nothing more sorrowful as a person not walking in his calling, not like, walking in disobedience to God's calling. Because God is doing so much when we are in tune with him. He is blessing, he is leading, he is building, he is expanding his kingdom. When we are disobedient, disobedient to his plan and to his guidelines, he is not building anything through us. He is working with us in order to re redirect it back on track and give us the joy of life back again. So what we're seeing here with the folks, with the Tower of Babel, what happened that actually when they started building, everything was in accordance. What happened that for the first time ever, people, people started speaking different languages. And God did not punish them for them so that they would experience, experience their harsh wrath. But it was a vivid sign for them that something terrible is about to happen or has happened. It's the big sign up in heaven. It's something that is devastating happening. And what people should have done at that moment is just father to, to cry out to God and say, Father God, we have failed. We don't understand each other. And God was trying to tell him, guys, this is the situation that I'm giving in those different languages so that you could not understand each other, so that you would see, and um, uh, it's my relationship with you that you are not understanding. There is no click. You're not in a pocket, like sometimes people would say. You're not grooving. So what's happening here that God, even actually looking at this story, he has provided and he initiated the restoration plan, the delivering plan, the redemption plan. And this is what we read right now in chapter 12. It's going to be the first portion of what we're going to be looking at today. Is chapter 12. We're going to read verses 1 through 4. So please turn with me, Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. We, uh, we read this. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who will bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And you... Uh, and in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Sounds like a great idea. It's amazing. For us, it's kind of difficult maybe a little bit to see what's happening here. But, you know, Abraham, how often we refer, like, you know, the father Abraham, right? Like, you know, he was the first, like, you know, the, he was a forefather, like the beginning of the nation of Israel. What has happened, he, his name was, it was like, different. It was Abram. And it says, okay, and the meaning of the name was exalted father. Well, it's kind of interesting when we look at Abram. His name is exalted father. He's 75 years old and he's childless. And he's childless. So God picks that something, someone that he thinks almost impossible to do anything. He picks a person that is probably, he was the least person to bring a son to the front, to the world. And he's going to use that person to bless the whole nations. And through him, he blessed us as well. Sometimes we are going through some certain life, like in the life cycles. We believe that if we are the people or this, our situation is so dim, is so dark, that there is nothing that, they, that God can redeem us or forgive us. You know, when it comes to the whole forgiveness aspect, we see, we see that as we read this passage, we don't see anybody crying out to God. 
We don't see those folks or different nations and the tribes sometime later, actually quite a bit of later of that occasion of the Tower of Babel, of that devast devastation that happened to people. We don't see people crying out to God. We don't see people coming in repentance. We don't see people asking for forgiveness. But God himself decided, I am going to do that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the one who would write a message. I'm going to be the one who would take some people and deliver my message. And I'm going to make him my, like my messenger. And I'm going to show faith. I'm going to show my glory through him. I'm going to show that glory through somebody who's, who doesn't deserve that. He was a pagan worshiper. He lived in a place called Ur, uh, Ur uh, Chaldean. That's the place where people worship so many different gods in so many different forms and fashion. That's the person likely not to come to Christ and be disobedient to Jesus and be disobedient to God. So God takes it. He does something impossible. He starts talking to that person. He's leading, to, no, he's leading Abraham to himself and he has given a chance. He has given him a chance to live by faith. So we see, we see that amazing thing that God initiated a renewed relationship with human being. You know, this is a great analogy for us. I would love to make it really practical right, uh, right here, right now. Is that what comes to like in a forgiveness? You know, I think the dumbest thing we can do when we are offended is just to sit around and wait for the person to come back to us and ask for forgiveness. I think it's the dumbest thing we can do. Another thing, if you are a person that who actually who offended somebody, you know this is the battle that happens between two people: somebody who offended, and if, like, uh, somebody who was like, uh, someone who offended the other person, and the person who was kind of sinned against. Right? Whoever was offended is waiting for the apologies. Whoever offended that, that person at the first place thinks like there is no way that apology can be taken or the forgiveness can be granted. You know, sometimes there is that battle with this of what's going on. And God understood it big time. So here's the lesson for us. Regardless of the fact if we were offended or if we were sinned against or we were the ones who offended others, let us make the first step. Just let us make the first step. If we had a certain like, in a conflict or a fight or something, please get back and ask for forgiveness. Or go back to the person and say, I forgive you for that. That could be some misunderstanding. There could something happen to that. Please reconcile for that. Because if we are to be imitators of God, as, for, as Ephesians 5.1 says, that be imitators of God. So God was the first one who, I mean, God was the one who instituted or initiated the forgiveness to human, to human beings, to us. So he gave us his son when we least deserved it. There was no merit, we didn't do anything great, and nothing, nothing surprised God in our behavior. We were sinners, dying in our sins and transgress transgressions. We were hell-bound, but God changed things around, and He gave us a chance to get on that path to be heaven-bound again. So God is restoring us in himself for his glory so that we can, we can experience the joy of forgiveness and joy of salvation. Not us, but God did that. And only now we can truly forgive because only forgiven people can truly forgive. Only forgiven people can truly forgive. But look that this relationship has grown so far that actually at this point is happening here that I am going to bless all of the nations. Something amazing is going to be happening in your life. And this is, this is what we're going to read in, verse, read in verse 4, chapter 12, the book of Genesis. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed Haran. He took his wife, he went off on a trip, and a little later in verse 7, we're going to see this. It's going to be interesting. Verse 7, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, not offsprings, like in a plural, but to your offspring, like in a singular tense that we see here, I will give you this land so that he built, so that he built there an altar to the Lord 
had prepared to him. So he built an altar to the Lord who had, prepared, or who had appeared, rather, I'm sorry, who had appeared to him. So when we see, like, when a, when a person and God meet together in conversation, what happens that there is no way that the person would not worship God. So when, when we as people, we encounter our God, when we meet with him, we're going to worship him. We're going to recognize who he is. We're going to submit ourselves and our will to him. And we're going to get a lot of joy doing that. We're going to get a lot of joy doing that. So as of right now, we can even look through our lives and see what's happening. But just let's see what brings us the most joy. It, it is a joyful period right now for us or not. If it, it is not so, please see and, and ask God to search your heart and just show you where you're lacking the joy. What caused that joy deficiency? So we're looking at this situation. God institutes that. He rebuilds the relationships. He sees us and he places us inside of his plan. And he sees us in Jesus himself because when he talks about an offspring, He's not only talking about a biological child that he will receive some 25 years later. He's seeing Jesus Christ who's going to come through him to all of the nations. And so when, come, when it comes to us, we are really missional. And that passage is really missional for us because the one who lives inside of us now, which is Christ and Holy Spirit living there. So what happens is that he's bringing forth Jesus and redemption and blessing. Because what happened that God promised Abram that I'm going to be somebody, I'm going to bring blessings forth through your life. And today Christ is saying, come to me who are heavily laden because I would love to bring blessing into your lives and through your lives to others. I would love to restore you and I would love to restore others. I would love to redeem you, and I would love to redeem through you other people that you're surrounded by. So that is great. That's something that only God can do. God doesn't focus just only on our immediate situation, but God is focused for our eternal gratification. He's not looking where, where, where we are now. He is looking where, and he's taking us where we will be forever. That's the blessing of God that we get. So when, when we see that story is being developed, we're going to skip a couple of chapters. We're going to look at chapter 15. We're going to see that it's, it's been developed even in a more beautiful way. So we're going to see that in chapter 15, verses 1 through 6, the book of Genesis, we will see that God commands us to trust that he will keep his promises. We will see his promises to come through this person. Chapter 15, verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord God Almighty, right? The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. It's about, it's 25 years later, 24 rather, years later of that first initial blessing that he heard. And Abram said, verse 3, but Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And that and the heir of my house is Elysia of Damascus. But Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, for your very own son shall be your, your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring, not offsprings, but the offspring be. And he believed in the Lord and he, count, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So the Abram, that father, that exalted father, at that, at that moment, he's, he's fatherless. 
Some people probably mocked him for that. You know what happened to Rokin back in the days that people were named in order to describe a certain feature. For example, like, like you know, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not sure why my parents named me the way I'm named, uh, uh, the way I'm named, with a name that I'm named. You know, my name is Yuri. That means farmer. Well, I run away from farming as fast as I can. So I think my parents had a sense of humor. They should have called me anti-Yuri. You know, it's kind of interesting that, but the name was given to describe a certain to describe a certain feature of the person to bring forth a message. So uh, Abraham, he was probably mocked for quite some years. But God really, really prepared him to do something amazing through him. So he's telling him right now, again, 24 years later, after the big appearance before him, as an act of his grace, he's telling me that my grace is enough. I, am, I'm, I have not given up on you. There will be a certain time. I will do a miraculous thing through you. God doesn't give up on his people. Amen? He just doesn't give up like that. He is God. And one of the things I would love to share, share one of the blessings with you that really was just profound and astounding for me. It's just a, like a recent discovery or a recent revelation that God really gave to me is, is going to come in this way in fashion. Is that you know that any relationship that we have here, almost any relationship except one can be broken. You know, partners can stop being partners at a certain moment, right? You know, as far as in construction, you know, we talked about this. You know, something may happen and you may cancel the order or the client can do so, do for non-performance or whatever. So you're not going to be bound by the contract anymore. When you invest in something in somebody in your relationship, you can pull out of your investment. You know, there is a strategy. The next, next thing I'm going to tell you right now, that sometimes even, like, you know, the husband and the wife, they can stop being a husband and a wife for one, one another. That's the devastation. It's breaking God's law. But unfortunately, some people go through this. There is one thing that cannot be broken. You just can, you can deny that, but it's, gonna, it's, gonna, it's not, it's not going to change anything. The relationship between like the father and the son, between a parent and a child, this is the situation. A son can never stop being a son to his father. He just can't. He may renounce that. He may run away that, as I shared the story earlier, he may not be with his son. But every single time, at any given moment, when the DNA test will be taken, the DNA will show you, the test, the test will show you whom you belong to, who is your father. You just cannot stop being a child for your father. This is why when it comes to our great God, we just cannot stop being children for our great God who is all-powerful, who is all-present, who is all-knowing. And this is why even sometimes in our, in our apostasy or sometimes stupidity, when we run away from him and we say, we need you no more, God is not going to be, his feelings are not going to be offended. His feelings are not going to be offended. He's not going to be you know, like gonna sitting in the corner of heaven somewhere saying, like, you know what, my son betrayed me, well, or my daughter, or let him do whatever he wants to do. He's going to pursue you. He's going to, he will be working in you. He will be bringing, bringing up more of his love. Sometimes it will come in the form of the discipline. But he loves you so much that there is no way that he can forget, uh, forget about you. He loves us so much that there is no way that he can forget about us. There is no way. And we see here right here. Abram, who's, uh, who's standing there, probably has gone through some shame. But God has not forgiven him. God has been blessing him and preparing for something amazing. So any situation that we may, go, may be going through right now, either up or down, either like in a glorious moment or the most toughest moment of your life, it's the preparation step for something amazing that God is about to do through us. But the question is, are we ready to accept that? Please don't give up on God. Please do not give up 
on God. Please do not give up on Jesus. He's going to pursue us. He's going to make that blessing. He will bring forth the blessings through us. Through us, the fountain of life will be springing forth. He is bringing his offspring as a blessing to Abram and a restoration to his name. And his name was later changed from Abram to Abraham. That meant the father of multitudes, and rightly so. So God is about to change our destiny. As he changed the destiny of Abram by making him an Abraham, he's going to change, he's going to change his status, his position, he's going to be leading them. And Abraham, at that moment, Abram, and later named Abraham, he believed in that, and that was righteousness. And the righteousness was to accept God the way he is, the glorious God, that God can do absolutely everything. And when we accept him like this, he will be bringing forth his blessings and his future through us. It's not going to stop there when we saw that God is faithful to his promises. He never forgets. He is never late. He is always on time. We may think he's a little bit later. He, de he delayed somewhere, but he's always on time. So we're trusting him with his timing. Amen? We're trusting him with his timing. And what's going to happen right now, we're going to see this in chapter 17. So please turn to this. We're going to see it in chapter 17. Let's read verses, a couple of first verses. I'm going to go back and forth on some of them. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. But be blameless that I may take my covenant between, I, 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 that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. He made that covenant earlier in chapter 15. We didn't read through these verses, but God made that covenant. He made Abram to take some of the animals and split them apart. And even though, even though that sometimes we need to see this, that covenant is that eternal, it's a forever promise of doing something. And in the covenant, usually there are, there are two people that get together. Like the same thing as in, in marriage. The marriage is a covenant when two people, they decide to be with one another, to become one with each other, to become one before God, and be like this until God will take somebody, one of them home or both of them. That's covenant. The covenant is not based on the performance. The covenant is not based on the appearance. The covenant is based on, the, on your will and dedica dedication and determination. So God is a dedicated God. He is determined God. And He is saving us through, uh, from ourselves and giving us that glorious future. So that's the kind of God we have. We have our God cares. Our God cares. Not Obamacare, right? He doesn't. We're changing to somebody who's trying to steal it from that. God cares. And so the, we come to that caring and loving God. And we appeal to Him. We appeal to His standards. We see that, that Almighty God is about to do something amazing. He's given a covenant a little, little bit later. We can read that actually what's going to happen, that the circumcision which had to be installed. Let, let's let's take, a look, um, uh, take a quick look at verse 7. God says, And I will establish my covenant between you and me and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings and the land of Canaan and an ever, for the everlasting possession. And I will be their God, he says. So God is promising the land, the offspring, and the blessings and he's bringing that forth at a certain time. Verse 9, And God said to Abraham, he already changed his name. As, as for you, you shall keep my covenant and you and your offspring after you throughout their generation. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. Well, it sounds painful for man. 
So what's going to happen is that actually the whole circumcision is that the part of their flesh had to be cut off at a certain time. And Abraham is being 99 years old. It was really, really painful, but what God was really trying to teach them, it was like a for, something that was amazing is going to happen in the future, that God will get rid of our flesh and it will give us something new. So that was something, uh, so they can rem be reminded of that, that God is not done in working through the people and redeeming, redeeming them. That's the blessing that we get in that, through this just picture of circumcision. So God made that. He said, actually, that had to be your part in something that I am doing, that I will be reading you off your flesh. And we know that in Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, it says that God will give us new glorious bodies because our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. We just only have the permanent residency here, right? We have a green card here on earth. So green card holders, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you have become United States citizens, you have forgotten. No, I'm no, just kidding. God has given us the promise and the pledge of the restoration in Him. God has given us an eternity for giving us a chance to come to Him. He's given us a chance to see this. And would you please turn with me? It's going to be the last passage we'll read. 1 Corinthians 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We see, we're going to see God who has not given up on us. We're going to see the story of our lives being redeemed. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteousness will not, in that unrighteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. By the power of our God. When we're looking at our God who has not given up on us, we see that He is changing our past and bringing His glorious future into our lives. He initiated that process of restoration. He made that pledge to us to be faithful. And we know that as Hebrews 13, 8 says that, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we can come to Him and be washed by Him, repent of our sins, and have our lives restored. That's the story of the most beautiful God, whom we can call Father. Let's pray.